Okay, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Assalatu Wassalamu Ala Rasul al I hope everyone's well. Welcome to today's lesson. It's our 10th one. And the topics that we'll be covering today, inshallah, are as follows. So we'll be continuing with Salah. So we've looked already at the importance of Salah, the rewards of Salah, the consequences of not praying. And now we'll start looking at the actual, some of the actions of, of prayer and how we actually pray, inshallah. So we'll be looking at the requirements before prayer. So we'll start from the beginning to the end, inshallah. So today we'll be looking at some of the requirements before prayer and alongside of that the adhan, the call to the prayer, how it was revealed and some of the words. We'll then look, continue with our continuation of looking at manners and we'll look at the manners of how to give salam, assalamu alaikum, because even something like this, there are manners and etiquettes of how to do it. We'll then look at the jamarat inshallah and then we'll take questions, well there are no questions today from anybody so we'll just perhaps skip that part. Okay, so let's begin inshallah, okay? So we see first of all, but one of the first requirements before we start prayer is what is to is to make sure that we are facing the Kaaba. So who can remind me, please, what was the first Qibla? What was the first direction of prayer of the Muslims? Which was the first direction of prayer of the Muslims, please? And we've covered this in one of our earlier lessons. So which, which direction did the Muslims used to pray towards at the beginning, right? Okay, let's see whose answer it is. And this is Abid, and he said Jerusalem. Um, Masjid al-Aisha Hassan said Masjid al-Aqsa I think he knew which is correct and they're, they're both one of the same place essentially so that's correct so the Muslim used to pray to Jerusalem and the command was given to face towards Mecca or the Qibla or the Kaaba as we know so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran Surah Al-Baqarah so turn your face toward Al-Masjid al-Haram and wherever you meaning we the believers are turn your face towards it so a Muslim is required to make their best effort to find the Qibla direction even if they're, if they're unsure and they're trustworthy people to ask, then they must ask or use whatever is available to them, such as a compass or the direction of mosques in the area. And if there's no way to be completely sure, then they must make their best effort. So essentially, you try your best. So before we had the smartphones, I remember when I was working, I'd go to different workplaces, for example, and then you'd get your compass out and you have to remember on the first day, I need to take my compass to work and there's a bit of a, a, bit of a flack, flaff or trying to, you know, find the directional prayer. It's, you know, a bit messy, but nowadays things are much, much easier because obviously most of us, or particularly adults, we all have smartphones and on that, obviously, we've got apps and we have a compass app. So now it's much, much easier to find the de direction of Qibla. So wherever we are, we make sure our, our level best to make sure that we're, we're facing in Salah towards the Qibla. And if we can't, we're not sure, we ask someone. So that's one of the requirements before prayer that we have to do, inshallah. Okay, so the requirements is the first requirement is facing the Kaaba. So it's very important. The next requirement is that we stand in prayer. Okay, so this is important. So we see that the prophets are something should stand in both obligatory and voluntary prayers. So they're like we've discussed this before. And who can describe for remind me the Arabic word of the compulsory rakahs in prayer? So when you look at prayer, there are some compulsory rakahs and some recommended. So the, the ones that we have to do are which what are described as what? So let's have a look at some of the answers. Well done, Hassan, well done, Muhammad, all saying farad. Okay, good. And what are the not compulsory then? So what's the not compulsory? What do we normally refer to them as sunnah prayers? Okay, well done, well done, okay? So Allah says in Quran, stand before Allah devoutly, okay? So, so there's two, two um, references here, two meanings here, isn't there? First of all, that we are commanded, if we are able to just stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and devoutly obedient, okay? So you don't stand in a lazy manner, you don't stand you know, just looking around and, and no, you stand in it devout, you know, you're in front of the Lord of the heavens and the earth, you try your hardest to, pr to have prayer with something called khushu, and it's narrated that some of the earlier people, there could be all kind of things happening around them, you know, uh, uh, dangerous things, horrific things, but they would maintain their dignity in prayer, they wouldn't stop praying, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be distracted, whereas today the smallest things happen and, you know, we get distracted in our salah, we start sniggering, someone does something and it's not it's not good we need to try and you know as the quran says and um, de be devoutly obedient in our standing in salah so continuing what do we see as for those who are unable to stand due to illness or infirmity they are permitted to sit on the floor or on a chair however if a person is able to stand for even part of the even part of the prayer he should do so so, so this so the the default position is that you begin by standing in your salah. That's the starting position. Whether it's farad salah, whether it's voluntary, this is what you do, inshallah. 
Um, but if you can't if you can't stand up for whatever reason you've got injury or you're ill or sometimes people are very old then you are allowed to sit down even the, the instances if things are that bad you can lie down but pray you must pray you must um, in the first instance standing if not standing then sitting and if not sitting then lying down okay and I, I'm smiling because I remember an instance many many years ago when there was a young man he told me he wasn't sure how to pray okay so when he went to the mosque he wasn't sure how to pray. So what do you do? You copy someone. Okay, so you're not sure. You, know, you go. You, know, you haven't really been concentrating the lesson. So you go to the mosque and you're not sure how many rakats do I do? Because of what you do, you copy someone. So he said, right, I'm going to copy someone. So he finds like the oldest person in the mosque. Obviously, old people tend to have big beards and they look very religious and they have the thobe and the hat. And so he said, right, this old person here, I'm going to copy him. Now, as it happens, the old person was very elderly and he prayed sitting down. And legitimately, he could because he obviously was very elderly. But this other young man in the prime of his youth, who should obviously be praying standing, he sat down as well, near him, looking at him and trying to copy him, but prayed in a sitting down kind of manner. And afterwards, people, I'm sure he said that somebody asked, you know, why are you praying this way? And obviously he couldn't say I was copying that person. But later on, he realized that obviously, you know, if you do want to copy someone, then copy someone who's standing in their salah, not someone who's sitting. So at least he learned the lesson, but he learned it the hard way. Okay. So the requirement in prayer is what? is to make sure that we are standing in prayer. And often, you know, I've seen you go to the mosque and, you know, football injuries are a common one. You see somebody and they're sitting down and they're quite young, you know, and say, well, what's happened to them? And often, you know, I've hurt my leg playing football or something like that. And now I've got to sit down in my prayer. So in those, in those situations, the person ill, uh, he's unwell, he's not able to, so that's permissible for him to do that, inshallah. Okay. But the, but the, start, the default position, as I say, is to, is to stand up in our salah. Okay. The next thing that I want to come on to is the sutra. Sutra. So, who can tell me what is the sutra? So, let me ask you guys first of all, what is the sutra? So, what is it? Does anyone know? Again, no googling and no asking anybody. But what is it? The sutra. What, what is it? What is it? Does anyone know? Normally, I get some quick answers, and there's nobody answering now. So, I'm presuming that no one knows the answer to that question. No, no one at all. Okay. I'm, a little bit surprised i thought somebody would have known but i can suppose that kind of shows that and and it's a fact that people don't really take it into that much importance but it is very important so let's learn together inshallah what it is okay so what is it so it is obligatory to pray facing a sutra or brackets a screen a barrier a wall or object the head of the place of prostration whilst performing the prayer the sutra acts as a barrier between yourself and others whilst praying. It also allows others to walk in front of you as long as the object is between you and them. So let's explain that. So basically, it's something that's in front of you. Okay, so really, if you've got a wall, so you pray right at the front of the mosque, which is good to do because we know that the first row is the, is the row that carries the most rewards. If you go there, then that wall becomes your sutra in, in effect. Okay, but if you haven't got a wall, you can place something in front of you um, that acts as that and then anybody basically who walks in front of you should not walk in between you and that thing so for example the sutra could be like a large bag or something like that you know so they shouldn't walk between you and that bag they should walk beyond that bag so you imagine as you're praying and in front of you let's just say it's, it's a largest bag for example and then that person is walking in front of you shouldn't walk between you and the sutra it should walk beyond the sutra so i hope you understand that similarly if you're walking to the mosque now and someone is praying and in some mosques they've actually got, you know, like a wooden, you know, they've actually got cut out wood basically, it acts like that. And you can see it's so don't walk in between that person and this sutra, rather walk beyond that inshallah. And the evidence for this is the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu do not pray except towards a sutra and do not let anyone pass in front of you. But if someone continues, then fight him for he is a companion with him, meaning shaitan. So, you know, fight, obviously, you don't get out your prayer and start hitting that person, obviously, right? What you can do, as scholars have explained, is just kind of put your arm forward, just so, because that person might not know that you're praying, or they might be in a world of their own, or they might not know the rules of prayer. And then, so, so what you do, you just gently just put your arm up, so that person realizes, and he'll kind of step back a bit, inshallah, and give you space, and not walk directly in front of you, okay? The sutra should be approximately a forearm's length above the ground because the Prophet ﷺ said, when any of you prays in front of him, something such as a stick on the end of a saddle 
uh, like that he should pray and not worry about anyone who passes in front of that. So that's the example of how high it should be. Your forearm, you know, up to your hand, up to you know the middle, just before you get to your elbow, that kind of thing. Your forearm, basically. So something like that in front of you. Like I say, you could have a rucksack from school or something like that. You place in front of you is perfectly acceptable. Like in some mosques, they have like properly cut up and um, piece of wood that you can use, inshallah. But th these are things that you can use. Um, th these are things that you can use. Okay. And like Hassan says, how can you fight someone in your namaz? So as I just explained, it doesn't literally mean the word fight. You know, you're not fit to get up and start fighting them. You're just supposed to make some sort of gesture so that person understands and knows that you're praying here and he may not know the rules. Um, and then he will just step back and give you space, inshallah. And likewise, you should do that as well if you're walking in front of somebody. Okay. Um, but just, just remember, if let's say if you're praying in Jamaat and the Imam is there, then you can walk into a row walk in front of someone as long as you don't walk in front of the imam so that's really important make sure when you let's say if you join the prayer don't walk in front of the imam but you can walk along somebody in prayer behind the imam because effectively the imam is a sort of for the people okay so these are the requirements before the prayer and so i hope you understood that let's move on and the next thing before you're starting to pray is to make sure that you have the intention or the niya so the prophet said actions are only according to their intention and everyone will have what they intended okay so the reason why behind the reason why you do something determines its reward so this explained in the prophet there's a hadith so he described the hijrah so again who can tell me what is the hijrah please who's tell me what is the hijrah so what was the hijrah okay okay good hassan mecca to medina yeah, Anissa and Fatima, that's right, Mecca to Medina. Good, good. And so, uh, and we've covered this before. Yes, you're right, Farah, when the Prophet moved to Medina along with the companions. But the question I just ask you now then, who, who was the companion that went with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So the companions that went at different times, basically, and we've covered it, that's what I'm asking you. Yeah, Abu Bakr, well done, well done. Well done. Um, and which was the cave that they had to hide in? The cave of? Hira, well done, okay, okay. No, Jabal Nur, wasn't it? Because the cave of Hira is where the revelation began, I think. Yes, let's remember that, inshallah. Okay, yeah. Okay, let's carry on now. So Jabal Nur. So continuing. So, so in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ explained when he was talking about um, the Hijra. So he said that the people who went from Mecca to Medina, there was a person who went along with them. But he went to marry someone. So the Muslims, all of them, they went. Why? For the sake of Allah. So they could settle in Medina. They could live with Rasulullah They could expand the state of Islam. So that was their reason. And they got a huge reward. This was the man. He went with them. He went through the hardships. He went through the hunger and the thirst and the danger of Quraysh attacking. All of these kind of things. But he perhaps got hardly any of the reward because he didn't do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He did it to marry someone. Fine, he wanted to marry someone. That's okay. But he won't get the same reward as the people who did it for the sake of Allah, you know, to, like I say, to establish the state of Islam and to pray and to and get, leave the Quraysh. He didn't do it. He won't get the same reward as them because their intention was to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So one of the requirements before prayer is that we have the intention. We have the right intention. So the explanation, the worshiper must have the intention in his heart of performing the prayer for which he is standing. The intention is essentially an awareness of the action in the heart, which precedes the action itself. Such as if a person were to be asked, why are you standing? He would say, I'm going to pray such and such a prayer. So he's got to be conscious why he's standing there. He gets there, maybe he puts his masala out, and that's fine. He's obviously put his masala out, he's going to pray now. So someone asks him, what are you? He says, yeah, I'm going to pray, Lord, I'm going to pray. Ask, that's my intent, that's, that's his intention done. Okay, that's it. So he doesn't need to do any more, but he must he must have the intention before the salah. So what have we learned about the requirements before the prayer? We said we have to make sure that we're facing towards the qibla, al haram. We have to make sure that we try and stand in our prayer. We have to make sure there is something in front of us. Obviously, if there's no one around, it's not such a huge deal. But if there's possibly someone will come, then you should pray with the sutra. Or it's a good habit to pray right at the front of wherever you're praying, inshallah. And you have to have the niya. So these are some of the requirements of the prayer. Okay, let's move on. And let's start looking at the adhan. So just a quick question. What is the name of the person who calls the adhan? What is the name of the person who calls the adhan? 
Mu'abbin, Bordon, okay. Bordon, Muhammad, and Al-Hamam, al okay, that's good. The Imam, no, not really, um, uh, Kareem, because the Imam is the one who normally leads the Salah. You're not wrong in the sense that the Imam can call the Adhan, it's perfectly acceptable for him to do that, but generally, in most masajid, you will have, um, <laughs> very good, Ahmed, uh, Adam, you will have someone um, who has the role of being the Imam who leads the Salah, and somebody else who has the role of calling the Adhan, and he's the Mu'adhan. So generally, there'll be a different person, but you're not wrong, Kareem. You could have the same person who does both the Adhan and, and leads the Salah, okay? So I was going to ask the question, who was the Mu'adhan of Rasulullah Sallallahu and Adam has Adam Akbar has answered, but does anybody else? Could somebody else tell me? Uh, well done, guys. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I've had two Bilal's and I've had one Abu Bakr. So no, Abu Bakr isn't correct. Although Abu Bakr may well have called the called the Adhan, but the Muaddin really, when we say the Muaddin of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we normally refer to Bilal radiyallahu anhu. And so, for I'd be very impressed if anyone knows the answer to this question. So where was it? that Bilal called the Adhan that really showed the equality, the social equality of Islam, the social equality, that there's no, there's no, <laughs> well done, Hassan said, well done, Muhammad as well, on top of the Kaaba, okay? So in the conquest of Mecca, <clears throat> when Rasulullah came into Mecca, what did he do? He destroyed the idols, he destroyed shirk, established Tawheed, but at the same time, he asked Bilal to call the Adhan from the top of the Kaaba, which is why, <clears throat> excuse me, which was to show the people that it doesn't matter if you're Arab, non-Arab, whatever, you're white or black, it doesn't matter. The one who is the most taqwa is the one who's most eligible, the most close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in this case, Bilal has one of the highest levels of taqwa. And so he calls the adhan. Okay, good. So we're going to go on, inshallah. We are looking at the adhan. Okay, so let's go through the adhan. Okay, so again, let me ask you one more question. Okay, and the question is this. During the adhan, um, there are in one in one adhan of the salah, in one adhan of the five salah, the words are slightly different. The words are slightly different. Okay, which salah is that? Okay, which salah is that? Fajr, Shakila, well done, well done, Aha, well done. And I was going to ask, um, what is what what are the words that are said, and what are they? So well done, Hassan. You've got the words. Can someone else tell me? Uh, well done, as-salatu khayrun min al-nawm. Well done, Muhammad and al-hamam. So, as-salat, as-salat, pray, khayrun is better min al-nawm than sleep. Okay, so we're going to come on to that, inshallah. So now, I'm going to show you the words of the adhan. Before I do that, just think for a second. Um, do you know what the words of the adhan are? So I'm going to show you that in the next slide. But I will, I think it's just interesting to know. Um, how was the, it was interesting how the adhan was revealed. So how was the revelation of the Adhan? Who, who did it come to effectively? And what were the situations? So briefly, can you tell me, how was the Adhan revealed to Rasulullah Sallallahu uh, Idris, I don't think so. Idris is not, I don't know what you mean by that, Bilal, but uh, no. So come on, how was, uh, well done, Hassan. Uh, it's a dream to Umar, okay? And a dream from Umar and Bilal. So Muhammad is definitely a dream from Umar Radil Anhu. That's the, and Bilal, I can't recall in this narration that I've got, it doesn't say it, but it may well be. I'll check that inshallah. Okay. But let me read to you the narration. Okay. So the, the, one of the companions, uh, according to the hadith of Abdullah ibn Zayd ibn Abd, Abd Rabihi, when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu decided to use a bell, even though he disliked it because it was what the Christians used. So the bell was originally going to be used to call the Adhan, but he didn't want that. And so the companion says, there appeared to me a dream, a man who was wearing two green garments in whose hand was a bell. I said, O slave of Allah, will you sell me that bell? He said, what will you do with it? I said, we will call the people to pray with it. He said, shall I not show you something better than that? So now here's actually the, what is better than this bell? That's not part of the hadith, I'm saying that, but okay. He said, shall I not show you something better than that? I said, yes. He said, and then he called the adhan, which we're going to look at, Allah, Akbar, Allah, Akbar, et cetera, which we're going to come to. When the morning came, I went to the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa and told him what I had seen. He said, this is a true dream, inshallah. 
Oh, get up with Bilal and tell him what you have seen so that he can call the call. He can give the call because he has a more beautiful voice than you. So I got up with Bilal and started telling him what I saw and he gave the call to prayer. Umar bin Khattab heard this whilst he was in the house and he came out dragging his cloak behind him saying, by the one who has been sent the truth or messenger of Allah, I saw the same as he and the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, to, to Allah be praised, meaning alhamdulillah. Okay, that's good. It's interesting. So I think, Muhammad, um, you said Bilal. So Bilal was involved. You can see that Rasulullah told that Sahabi, uh, Abdullah, to go call Bilal, tell Bilal to call Adhan. But from this, from this narration, Bilal didn't actually see the dream. That other companion, and Umar bin Khattab, definitely did. Okay, so that's how, that's how it was revealed. Okay, so in a dream to Umar bin Khattab. Very good. Okay, so let's go on now. And let's look at the words of the Adhan. So the words of the Adhan that the Mu'adhan called. And why does he do the Adhan? He does it to mark the beginning of the time of Salah. So, so the Adhan marks the, the beginning of the time of Salah. But my question to you is, what is called out when it's actually the time that people are going to stand up for Salah? Okay. Okay. So Hassan, I'll answer your question in a second. Okay. So my, my question is, what is it that so the adhan is called to mark the beginning of the prayer. Good, I have a couple of answers. Any more? Well done, Ibrahim. You've got the answer correct at ikama. So the ikama is done. So Hassan back to ikama. So adhan is called to mark the beginning of the time of salah, and the ikama is called to say that the, now actually the salah is going to pray like literally right now. The next few seconds we're going to pray salah, as uh, ikama, okay? Ikama salah. Um, and but Hassan asked the question: Is it true that Bilal used to cry when reciting adhan when Rasulullah died? Yeah, it's very true. So much so that he couldn't do the adhan. So it's not that he used to cry, just crying, you cry, a few tears fall down. But it is that kind of crying that no one, no one can hear what you're saying. You're that emotional, that is beyond words. So yeah, you know, a person can cry and still have a conversation. But another person can cry and cry and cry so profusely, so much, that no one can make out what they're saying. This is the crying of Bilal, radiyallahu anhu. He, he cried so much that he just couldn't call the adhan. When he used to say, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, I be witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. At that point, he would just break down because he would think of Muhammad Sasa and the times that when he'd say those words and he, Rasulullah would come out and Bilal would, would think about that and he'd just break down. He literally would break, he couldn't carry on anymore. So it wasn't just crying, it was like he couldn't carry on anymore. Okay. And one time later on in the Khalifat of Umar bin Khattab, he did call the Adhan. He called the Adhan and the people came rushing out because when they heard that Adhan, they thought Rasulullah back. They couldn't hear because they associated the Adhan of Bilal with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But obviously it wasn't to be. Okay. So what are the words of the Adhan? And the words of the Adhan are as follows. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah. Ashadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah. Hayya lal-salah, hayya lal-salah. Hayya lal-falah, hayya lal-falah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. So these are the words of Azan. And you say, as-salatu al-khayrun min al-nawm, you know, after hayya lal-falah in the salat al-fajr. And it's quite, this is, you can think about the meaning, can't you? Because imagine you're sleeping, right? And you're hearing the words of Azan. And something Mu'adhan says, you know, prayer is better than sleep. Boy, he must be feeling really guilty for carrying on sleeping after that because he's saying to you specifically, he knows what you're doing. You're like, prayer is better than sleep. So it's like, it's a beautiful, you know, think about the wisdom of it. It's amazing. And obviously, there's no point in doing that at the whole time or at the time because people are awake at that time. Okay, obviously, but you know, people might be asleep. But in the main, people are asleep. But the start of Fajr, it has this specific wording. Okay. So we'll go on. Um, and we'll just move on inshallah and just look at the meaning of the words. So the meaning of the words are what? Allahu Akbar means what? Allah is the greatest. Allah is the greatest. Allah is the greatest. Allah is the greatest. I bear witness that none has the right to worship Allah. You say that twice. And I bear witness, I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah. That's his twice. Come to prayer. Hayya ala salah. Hayya means come. As salah. Hayya ala falah. Come to success. So the prayer is success. Don't forget that. Okay, so when you go to pray, you're, you're praying for the action of prayer, obviously, but you're coming to something that will be success. Then again, Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest, none has the right to worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so when you hear the adhan, what are you supposed to do? When you hear the adhan, what are you supposed to do, guys? Come on, when you hear the adhan, and I want somebody who hasn't answered a question, so come on, 
somebody who hasn't answered a question, have a go. When you hear the Adhan, <laughs> very good, go to pray. That's, yeah, absolutely right, well done. That's not act actually what I was thinking, but you're absolutely right, go to pray. Well done. So Hassan's got the right answer. Anybody else? Anybody else? Come on. So you go to the prayer. Okay, good, 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 good. Yeah, very good. So there's good answers there. And um, so not talk. And that's an absolute right. Absolutely right. You're not supposed to talk. Um you've raised a hand. I'm happy for you just type a message. So if you want to type a message, I can see your messages. So make sure uh, that's probably easier. So somebody says go to wudu. Yeah, fine. So basically get ready for salah, right? And repeat the words of the adhan. So you get ready for salah, you know the prayers are going to start, so you get ready, or you go to the mosque and you repeat it, but very importantly, you repeat the words for the words of the adhan. Okay, um, so my next question is, in which part of the adhan do you, do you say something different? In which part of the adhan do you say something different? Well done, honey, you're correct, make wudu. Well done, honey, excellent, right? So for my next question, so you repeat the words of adhan, word for word, Except the Mu'adhin says something and you say something different. What is it? That's my question. That's my question. So the Mu'adhin says something and you... So normally he says, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. You say, Allah Akbar. He says, Ashadu Allah. You say, Ashadu Allah. But then he says something and you say something different. And my question to you is what? Yeah, well done, Bilal. So come to pray, come to Hayya al-Salah, Hayya al-Falah. What do you say? La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. Well done, guys. Well done. You did it. <laughs> Teamwork there. Okay, let's move on. Okay, guys, so I'll just, just explain it to you. So, first of all, some of the etiquettes of the adhan. Okay, so let's look at some of the etiquettes. So, placing the index figures in the ear. So, like that. So, when you call it the adhan, you can probably see me that Mu'azzin, normally he goes like this, inshallah. Okay, he then says the words, and normally when he says, Hayya ala salah, hayya ala salah, he turns to the right. Hayya ala falah, hayya ala falah, he turns to the left. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, and so on and so forth. So normally he's going forward like that in the direction of the Qibla, but Hayya la salah, Hayya la salah, normally turns to the right, Hayya la al-falah, Hayya la al-falah, normally turns to the left, and continues like that, inshallah, okay? Places the index fingers in the ears like that, and standing and facing the Qibla, okay? So the direction of the Adhan should be the direction of the Qibla, being in a state of wudu. Although it's not an explicit requirement, you'll struggle to get any evidence specifically, but the scholars generally understand this to mean that as someone who's praising Allah, you know, it should be in a state of purity since the adhan is for the remembrance and the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and this, and then finally, there's a great reward of calling the adhan, okay? So the Prophet of the Hadith in Bukhari, if the people knew what there is in the court to pray in the first row, and, and then they would draw, they would know the ways but drawing lots, then they would draw lots. I mean, they would compete, basically. So this one would say, I want to call the adhan. That one would say, I want to call the adhan because the reward is so great. In another hadith, the mu'adhin will like have the longest neck on the day of judgment. It's like, a, it's like a, a, an expression of honor, of dignity, of respect, because this voice, this, this neck, this, from this came the voice which called people to the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you get the chance to call the adhan, then try and call the adhan. And you can do the adhan in your house as well. So it's a good, it's a good habit to get into, inshallah, in terms of calling the adhan. It makes it a shaitan run away. So try and get in the habit of doing that, inshallah. So these are some of the etiquettes of adhan. When you hear the adhan, so this is what we said, the sunnah recommends that whilst the adhan is being called, one should listen attentively. So when I think Shabazz said, um, to be quiet, that's perfectly right. So listen attentively. So if you listen attentively to something, you, you're quiet, obviously. And repeat every line silently after the mu'adhin. But when he says, hayya la salah and hayya lal falah, you should say, la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. There is no might and there is no power except with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So good. So we've done quite a lot of time on Salah today, about half an hour, so that's fine. And um, because the rest of it will be a bit shorter, and we'll try and finish at 2.40, 2.45 as normal, inshallah. So good. And good participation from you guys today. So that's really good to see. So well done and thank you for that. Jazakallah khair. Okay, let's talk about um, the Salah. Uh, sorry, the giving the Salam. Okay, so let me guys ask you guys, what does Assalamu Alaikum mean? What does Assalamu Alaikum mean? What does it mean? Assalamu Alaikum. Anyone know? Come on, I'm surprised you should know this. Yep, yep, well done. Uh, two, three, yep, everyone's got that. Hassan, uh, Asia, Adam, Elisa, yeah, good, good, good. Peace be upon you. Uh, yeah, that's it essentially. Peace be upon you. So well done, guys. So that's good. So let's look at that, inshallah. Okay. So, guys, I'm saying rather than raising hands, if you guys can simply just ask me anything you want by typing in questions, that's probably the best way, inshallah. Okay. Okay, fine. And so let's move on now and let's look at the Islamic, the meaning of these things, inshallah, okay? 
Okay, so the Islamic greeting is to say Assalamu Alaikum. It means may the peace may peace be upon you. So it's got a meaning, hasn't it? You, know, you see somebody, you say hello, hi, how's things? You know, it's really it's got but peace be upon you. You know, you're asking somebody, you're making like a dua for them, aren't you? Here, you're saying something that actually has got a meaning to you. That I'm hopeful that you're in a peaceful situation. And Salam is one of the names of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So that's really good, inshallah. Okay, so. Um, so it's really good to say that. So, assalamu alaikum. The Prophet sallallahu said, "By him in his hand, my soul is." Meaning, by Allah. So he's swearing by Allah. You will not enter Jannah until you believe. That's important. So Jannah is for the believers, those who believe in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa taala. So Jannah is for the believers. You will not enter Jannah until you believe, and you shall not believe until you love one another. That's really powerful. You know, Islam is a religion where we should have love and affection. Not just for our, our 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 loved ones and our family, but wider than that. In terms of you, the Muslims as well, you should have love for them, inshallah, love for the sake of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And unfortunately, we see lots of Muslims fighting and killing each other on TV, and it's really wrong. And it's one of the most major sins that a person can do. It's horrendous. But the, the Sunnah of the Prophet is to is to share love and uh, between each other of the, from the Muslims. And the Hadith continues until you love one another. And may I inform you of something: if you do it, you will love each other, promote salam amongst yourselves. So when you say salam, then it promotes a sense of um, brotherhood, sisterhood, uh, caring, compassion, these kind of things. So you know, you meet someone, you smile, salam alaikum, brother, or you say salam alaikum, sister. In that kind of thing, it's a nice thing. It's a nice thing. It, you know, makes someone feel special, makes you feel important. So it's a nice way to try and do that as much as we can, inshallah. Unfortunately, we don't. It's not, I'm not saying it's a forgotten sunnah, but it's not something that sometimes we feel embarrassed, we might be outside, you see another Muslim, and you are embarrassed say salam. It shouldn't be like that. It should be confident of our religion and, and the words that go along with it, inshallah. And so um, the Quran says, when you are greeted with a greeting, greet with one which is better than it, or at least return it. Indeed, Allah is over all things watching, essentially. An accountant is probably not a good, good use of the word there, but Allah is ever over all things. Allah is watching all things. Allah is all aware. So Allah knows what we're doing. So if you're greeted with salam, try and do something better. That's important, okay? So normally someone says, assalamu alaikum. So say something, at least say as alaikum as salam, but try and say something better than that. So what is better, if someone says assalamu alaikum to you, what is better than saying assalamu alaikum? Come on guys. So someone says assalamu alaikum. Um, okay, so Abdullah Sabir, you said Allah Hafiz means Allah will take care of you. Okay, yeah, fine. But the sunnah is assalamu alaikum. So the, really, the, the more we can stick the sunnah, the better it is. Um, well done. Uh, so, uh, okay, good, 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 good. So everyone's got it. Most of you have got it. Yep, well done. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, that's better. Okay, so you can say assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam. Fine. But if you say wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, it's even better. And let's look at it from the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, a man came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said assalamu alaikum. And so the Prophet said 10. That's <laughs> interesting, this one. And another came and he said assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And the Prophet said 20. And another came and said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. And the Prophet وسلم, said 30. Hadith in Tirmidhi. That's important, isn't it? So the third person, he like got three times the reward of the first one, right? And the second one got double the reward. Why? Just because he took the time and said, Peace be upon you. May the mercy of Allah and his blessings. So look, he's making a stronger dua, a more better the dua may the mercy of allah be upon you may the blessings of allah be upon you it's really nice it's a very powerful statement to say to someone inshallah okay um okay so hassan is asking in salah why do you only say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah not assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh you can say the latter assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh but general sunnah generally when we teach salah and you when we'll cover it inshallah um, the general sunnah that the Prophet generally used to say was well, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. So that's what we say, inshallah. Because again, with all things, just because something is more automatically, don't assume it's something better. It's like saying, you know, if I do if I do six prayers every day on a compulsory basis, it's, surely it's better than five. No, it's not. Because the sunnah of the Prophet is five. And sometimes we might think something is better, but we always revert back to the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad. So again, so I'll give you an example. Three men came to the Prophet and one of them says, right, I'm going to fast every day, right? And the other one says, 
I'm going to pray, uh, stand in prayer all night long, every night. And the third one says, I'm never going to marry. So therefore, I'm not going to spend time with wife and kids. I can just spend my time in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet sallam, he didn't like it. He told them off. He said, this is not from his sunnah. He said, I fast some days and other days I don't fast. I pray the night and I sleep. And I have married and I've got children. You know, I, I got married. So the Prophet said, so when we go to the kind of extremes and we think that, you know, I'm going to fast every day. And imagine that I'm going to pray all night, every night. I'm never going to have family. You know, having a family is one of the blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, sleep is a blessing. Okay. You know, not fasting, having those days where you're not fasting, it's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the sunnah is the perfection. Don't forget that. Not more, not less. The closer we are to the sunnah, the better that it is, inshallah. Okay, so good question. But wherever possible, you know, obey Allah and obey the Rasul. Okay, There's, and the sunnah is perfection. Sometimes, you know, Allah makes things easy for us as well. Like when you're traveling, prayers shorten. Someone can say, no, 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 I'm going to pray Lord. I'm going to do, no, 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 no. Allah is giving you something of ease. You know, I'm fasting, I'm traveling. Again, Allah is a concession. Don't fast, make you up later. You see, Allah, think, Allah chooses things that are ease. He gives us ease in the world, inshallah. Okay, this is some of the manners of giving salah. Let's continue. And the hadith, final hadith, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi said, there are no two Muslims who meet and shake hands and they'll be forgiven before they part. So again, this is an important sunnah to shake hands. Just a less caveat that obviously we're in a time of COVID. So don't start running around to everybody you see and start shaking hands. It's not wise. It's not right. Because what takes precedence of all these things is the safety of people, okay? And the scholars have clearly said, and they've told us that when you go to the mosque, for example, you know, even at Eid, and there's no hugging, there's no shaking hands. And so this is the hadith of the Prophet in, in circumstances which are correct, of course we follow it. But in these particular times, we don't. But remember the sunnah, the sunnah is to shake hands. So immediate members of your family who you live with, perfectly fine to do that, inshallah. Okay? So again, and there's a huge reward that sins are forgiven, okay? Let's move on and let's go on to Jamarat. So come on guys, what are the Jamarat? What are the Jamarat? Quick answers. Last couple of slides, 237, come on. What are the Jamarat? Mm, no answers yet, come on. <laughs> Hot coals? Um, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, Muhammad. I'm not sure where that come from. Um, the prayer on Thursday night, Jamarat Hassan. I'm surprised you said that. Yeah. I don't. I'm not quite sure what you mean by that, but but no. Oh, well done, Farah. The things you throw stones are excellent, Farah. So that's good. That's good. So Farah, well anybody, but as part of what actions of Islam? When are you doing it? As part of what actions of Islam? Do you know? Or anybody for that point? Hajj, well done, Shakila. Okay, good, Farah. Again, Hajj. Okay, and then. So, uh, uh, so this is the sunnah of which prophet? Which is sunnah of which prophet? Umrah, no one needs to say. You don't do this part of Umrah, it's only done as part of Hajj, okay? Okay, so Hassan saying Jumma night is Thursday night. I thought you're correct. You're absolutely right, Hassan. Jumma night is Thursday. Uh, you're right. You're absolutely right. Because the night precedes the day, but it's got nothing to do with the Jamarat. Okay, I think you're okay. Okay, I get it. Jumma Jamarat, you're seeing the linkage there. Okay, I understand. Um, but in this particular case, there's no linkage. But I, I, I entirely see what you're doing there. Well done. Okay, Ibrahim alayhi salam. Well done. Okay, and last question Who was he throwing the stones at? So we, we do it symbolically, it's a symbolic gesture. But it's a symbolic gesture to uh, shaitan. Well done, well done. Okay, good. So guys, let's have a look. So here we have the jamarat here, okay, on the left. So you can see they're really big, aren't they? There's three of them basically, right? And you throw seven stones. So all of these people, all of these people have to do it. And look at all these people here. Imagine all those people trying to go. And this is why it's, it is. This is a place where many accidents can happen because lots of people at the back, they start charging. People at the front, they're caught in between, you're going to turn back here, you're, there's no way you're going back there. So if you've forgotten your mobile phone, just keep on going because you ain't going back there anyway. So it's just that kind of thing, isn't it? It's just, it's just, look, all those people, everyone, and everyone wants to go there. And again, just the sunnah again is to throw stones like the size of a chickpea, you know, Jannah chickpea, you know, a really small pebble, basically. Yeah, like, alhamdulillah, I've been hajj. And you see people, and they start throwing their umbrellas and slippers. People get <laughs> People get their slippers and start throwing their slippers at it, which is just crazy. It's a symbolic gesture, a symbolic gesture, you know, throwing everything, 
and trying to blow it, you know, it just, it's just not right. There's some of this again about the sunnah. It's not about trying to cause pain to a block of stone here. It's a symbolic gesture because we're emulating the action of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. So obviously, like, for example, when you sacrifice an animal, as you're told to sacrifice, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a symbolic gesture, isn't it? And it's exactly the same here, inshallah. So again, the sunnah, the sunnah, the sunnah about how we do things properly. And so this is the importance of reading up before you go on something like Hajj or for any action of Islam, inshallah. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay. So, um, Hassan, I'll answer your question at the end, inshallah. So, I, I see your question. I will answer that question at the end, inshallah. Okay. So, okay. So let's just finish up on Jamarat. Okay. So, Jamarat. So, the Jamarat went. So, the Shaitan went to distract Ibrahim alayhi salam when he appeared to him at the first Jamarat. Okay. So, Shaitan comes to Ibrahim alayhi salam at the, that first place. And um, Jibreel said to Ibrahim alayhi salam, um, so pelt him. So Jibreel is the angel term. So he did that. Ibrahim Asad threw seven stones and he disappeared from him. Then he appeared him at the second Jumarat. Jibreel Aslam said pelt him. So he pelted him with seven stones and he disappeared again. And so on the third time, inshallah. And this action is imitated by the Hujjaj. That's the plural for the people who are doing Hajj. So we say Haji and the plural is the Hujjaj, symbolizing all the acknowledgement that Shaitan is one enemy and ought to be repulsed. So these are the Jumarat. And inshallah, when you get a chance to do Hajj, you will see all of that, inshallah. I think we'll stop there. I think Hassan had one question. Let's just have a look at that, inshallah, one second. Okay. Hassan said, is it true that peace and good relations are better than fasting, prayer, and charity as bad manners or bad for humanity? So first of all, the compulsory fasting, prayer, and charity has to come first. So you have to do, but you can't say, right, I'm going to have a peaceful person and show good relationship, but I'm not going to pray, I'm not going to fast, I'm not going to give sadaqah, as long as I'm, you know, giving peace to everybody and good, no, that doesn't work. Sunnah, the Prophet, sallam, the first thing that you'll be asked about in day judgment is salah, the salah, the salah, so this comes first, okay? So the compulsory things, no, these things, the pillars of Islam, they come first. Alongside of these comes these good manners, okay? Because the Rasulullah sallam said, I was not sent to perfect, but, but to perfect good manners. He said the closest one to one day judgment is one of the best manners, and he said, you can, and this comes back to your point, you can have the same reward as the one who prays in the night and fast in the day through your good character. So you've got a point, having peaceful and good relationships are examples of good character. You can have the same person reward as that one who doing the voluntary act, not compulsory. Compulsory you have to do. But, <coughs> excuse me, if someone's doing this voluntary act, you can have that same reward by you know, having good manners and saying salam and all of these kind of things, inshallah. But the best person, Hassan and all of you, is the one who does those fasting, etc. He does his fasting, etc., and prayer, and also has good manners. That's the, that was what Rasulullah was like. He did all the bunch of things. So Elias, so you asked a question, didn't you, last time about if Zohar and Asr are not prayed out loud, and it's Mughal and Isha and Fajr are, and you said it's for you said you've done a bit of research, and you said it's for reassurance. May well be the case. Jazakallah khair for that. Thank you for that. Inshallah for that contribution. Okay, Alhamdulillah, we'll conclude there. Inshallah. Thank you all much for your time, and um, please do go into Google Classrooms, do the quiz. And I look forward to speaking to you all next week, inshallah. Subhanahu wa bihamdi, subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika. Ashadu wa la ilaha ant, astaghfiraka wa atubu alayk. Thank you all very much. Jazakallah khair. Shabazz, thank you again.